one half of Kenya's population thinks that William Ruto is a corrupt and dictatorial lead who will run this country down. In contrast, the other half thinks he's a God-fearing leader who will save the country from state capture and years of dynastic rule. But seriously, who is William Ruto? In this video, we'll dig deep into his story, differentiate the truth from the propaganda, and present a well-balanced report on what Ruto's presidency means for this country. Stick to the very end, see whether William Ruto will be a dictator or a heaven-sent savior. Whether you like him or not, William Ruto is an ambitious, focused, resilient, charismatic, and tactical leader. Although debatable, he has single-handedly changed the political landscape in Kenya. To help us understand who William Maruto is and how he ran this country, let's examine his back story. William Maruto's story is exciting and bears all the ingredients for a rags to riches story. And he has time and again intimated how difficult it was for him to rise from the ashes and now become the current president of the largest economy in East and Central Africa. Ruto's fortunes changed when he met the late former president Moy. He thrust the young Ruto into politics which paved the way for his unprecedented rise in the corridors of power. At only that one years old, Ruto beat one of Kanu's strongmen, Ruben Chesire, to become Eldoret North MP in 1997. But that's only one side of the story. Ruto's rise to the top has been marred with accusation and successful trials of corruption and land grabbing. Perhaps unsurprisingly, this was expected, bear in mind that he was taught and mentored by the late president himself. They had a political father and son relationship. And the truth is, Moy was dictatorial and corrupt. He was surrounded by equally influential and greedy leaders who engaged in rampant corruption, land grabbing, retrogressive policies, and runaway nepotism and tribalism. Interestingly, his deputy Rigadi Gashagwa went through the same school, but that's a story for another day. Ruto's first taste of brutal political power was during the 1992 general elections. He was a leader in the infamous Youth for Kanu 92, popularly known as YK92. The dreaded organization tackled opponents with precision. At one point, it is said that they rounded up opposition supporters in one of Kenya's stadiums and mercilessly beat them. That said, Ruto and President Moy's meeting was under totally different circumstances. Both Moy and Ruto share a strong Christian background drawn from the AIC denomination. It is believed that the late Moy met Ruto as he led a youth choir at a local AIC church and admired his leadership skills. And from there, a political father and son relationship blossomed. Clearly, it's good to mention that Ruto's faith has not escaped his journey to the top. For personal or political reasons, his affiliation with churches and Christianity has played a vital role in his 2022 elections. This is one of the reasons a considerable number of his followers see him as a righteous leader anointed by God. Well, let's continue with our story. After Ruto successfully won the Eldoret North seat, not much happened during the first three years as he took his first elective politics baby steps. Ruto would get an opportunity to shine during Moy's last term. Before Moy left in 2002, he gave Ruto a life-changing opportunity. First, he made him into an assistant minister for home affairs, a position he held for a few months. But most importantly, he was running next to Uhuru Kenyatta, who was vying for the presidency in 2002. Ruto was among the few Kanu members who stuck around after Moy had a fallout with the Raila Odinga and people like George Saitoti. Campaigning for Uhuru gave Ruto a taste of a national outlook, and Moy's exit meant that the Kalenjin nation leadership was vacant. In a sense, he was allowing him to shine within the Kalenjin community plus 
running for presidential campaign gave him the much needed political experience and exposure to move forward. Even though Uhuru and Kanu lost the 2002 election, everyone noticed the ambitious William Ruto. And this would lay the groundwork for the next decade under Kibaki's leadership and his closeness to the presidency. Another opportunity would present itself in 2005 during the 2005 referendum. His party leader Uhuru Kenyatta joined Kibaki's government rebels Raila Odinga and Kalonzo Musyoka together with Mudavadi to campaign under the Orange Democratic Movement. Coincidentally, they won against the Kibaki-led onslaught. But the most critical though tragic occasion for Ruto was the 2007 elections. Ruto had the opportunity to lead the Kalenjin into the ODM party and successfully killed the Moi influence in that region. He had earned the kingpin title and was now ready to play with the big boys. During the controversial tallying at the former ECK National Tallying Center at the Bombers, Ruto was the most vocal, raising his profile even higher. Sadly, after the controversial elections, post-election violence broke out and Ruto was primarily accused of orchestrating the violence. He would get a stint as the Minister of Agriculture and Higher Education in the coalition government that formed after the post-election violence and what can only be described as massive rigging by both parties. Ruto, Uhuru and four others were accused at the International Criminal Court but their charges were dropped after Uhuru and Ruto won because they were president and deputy president respectively. Perhaps by sheer lack on high political instincts, Ruto has made life-changing moves that have positioned him as one of the best politicians in Kenya. For example, after Mo introduced him to politics, he ran against Ruben Chesire and won. Again, in 2002, when most people, including Raila Odinga, Kalonzo, Musioka, and George Saitoti, left Kanu, Ruto stuck around and supported Uhuru Kenyatta's first presidential bid. And of course, after they won the referendum, William Ruto chose to leave Kanu for the newly formed ODM party. Through the ODM party, Ruto earned respect among his community and uh, nationally a feat he could not have done under Uhuru, who was supporting a fellow Kikuyu at the time. He seized the opportunity to build a name for himself when he joined the ODM party as the leader of the Kalenjin nation and when he defended their votes at Bombers of Kenya in 2007. Another brilliant move was when he reunited with Uhuru Kenyatta as they ran for the presidency in 2013. This gave William Ruto more exposure. Lastly, after the 2008 post-election violence, William Ruto started positioning himself as a hustler. On multiple occasions, he would clearly explain the hustler narrative by sharing his life story, which most of his supporters could relate to. Knowing William Ruto roots, we can easily predict how he will run his government. So far, William Ruto has presented himself as a tactical and ruthless leader, especially when dealing with his opponents. Again, he is patient and calculating, and he knows how to get into desirable character. In hindsight, it's easy to see that Ruto knew he would one day go for the top seat. His political mentor, the late President Moy, was a dictator. Does that mean Ruto will be a dictator? Probably not. At least not as per the textbook definition of a dictator. One reason is that the 2010 constitution cut presidential powers and separated the three arms of government. 
to play by dictatorial rules, Ruto must control all arms of government, including parliament, the judiciary, and the executive. Even with the tyranny of numbers, Uhuru in his first term and second terms could not control the judiciary fully, which stopped most of the laws that were felt to be against the Kenyan constitution. But then again, Ruto is smart. He has an excellent understanding of how politics in Kenya and the world works. His mantra is quite simple. Money rules the world. And that's why he is willing to spend money on the best brains, including his opponents. In Swahili they say, Pesa ni sabuni ya roho. And indeed it is. Unlike his opponents, William Ruto has been a generous politician. He knows you need to invest through direct cash, investment opportunities, promises, and government positions to gain power. And if you are new to politics, well, welcome to Politics 101. The most idealistic thing about this is that you gain power even in places you didn't have in the first place. We have seen what an angry judiciary can do to a case when brought to them. For example, the judiciary was accused of playing activism in the BBI ruling tainted with emotions. Again, the judiciary has played a vital role in ensuring the sanity of our constitution is maintained. However, the judges are at liberty to rule based on external forces. In short, the law is quite expensive and requires a different transactional approach. Of course, members of the bench do take political sides, making it harder to control the judiciary in its entirety. But that doesn't mean it cannot be done. Well, from the evidence that we are looking at at the moment, it seems like Ruto is not a dictator. But does that mean Ruto is Kenya's savior? By their own admission, Ruto and Rigathi say that they inherited a country in bad shape, which could also be political rhetoric. Honestly though, Ruto and Rigathi were in the previous government. Ruto for 10 years while Rigathi for 5 years. In a sense, they are partially responsible for any economic crisis they found the country in. As we examine the facts and plan for the future, we only need to analyze their past track records and what was stated in their manifesto. The manifesto elaborated the idea of a bottom-up economy where the government plans to create a massive $2 billion hustlers fund. But the question is, is this what Kenya needs? In the past, Several funds have been in circulation in the national and county governments, including Weso Fund, Women Fund, Youth Fund, Machinani Funds, ETC. If we examine the statistics, the Kenyan shillings has been losing ground to the dollar profusely. Unemployment is at more than 40% and inflation is an all-time high. All this is coupled with a national debt of more than 9 trillion shillings. Ruto and his government must create a business-friendly environment to appease the country and by all means create jobs directly or indirectly. Also, William Ruto must tackle corruption, which is problematic considering the, his track record. After the post-election violence, he was accused of several corruption scandals and a land-grabbing saga. He was compared by the court to return Muteshi's land and pay him 5 million shillings. What's the verdict? Will William Ruto be a dictator on Kenya's savior? Well, from the facts that we have just seen, William Ruto might not turn out to be a dictator because the 2010 constitution protects us unless he changes it. And by changing it, we need to be involved as Kenyans through a referendum. 
So far, we have seen that the judiciary might save Kenyans from unconstitutional laws. And uh, so much has changed, unlike how it was when Moy governed this country. And the reason I think he might not be a savior also is because he was part of the previous regime that created a, uh, in quotes, economic crisis. And since he was part and parcel of that government, it means he might not bring a lot of change. And also, it's very hard to distinguish between Naruto and corruption scandals. Thank you for watching the video. And if you love such kind of content, please subscribe to the channel, drop a comment and a like, and please watch the next video. We'll be posting similar content.